Thanks, Yvonne. Um, yes, just quickly, my name is Liz Kada. I'll be the stage coordinator for the rest of today's session. Um, I'd just like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that the sessions are being recorded. And uh, please use the, the chat to ask any questions you have. Um, and without further ado, um, uh, we'll move on to the round table. Um, Uma tragedia anunciada. Uh, the fires at Villa Leopoldina, state negligence, and the endangerment of AV heritage. Um, this roundtable uh, is hosted by Alessandra Luciano and uh, Valeria uh, Davila, Davila, both from the No Time to Wait organizing team. Um, and uh, again, you will have opportunities to the opportunity now to ask questions that you've been saving from this last presentation. Um, over to you, Alessandra and Valeria. Thank you, Liz. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I hope that you can hear me okay. Um, thanks for joining us in our panel. And thank you so much, Ines, for <laughs> your mind-blowing presentation on the Cinemateca Brasileira. Um, before we introduce our amazing panelists today, we want to say that we are very, very excited about having this discussion about the Cinemateca because discussion about the field in countries other than the first world is rarely seen at no time to wait, but this is something that we want to change moving forward, um, which is why we also provide translation today so that everyone can express themselves more comfortably. The panelists today will be speaking in Portuguese and you will find at the bottom of the Zoom webinar panel an interpretation button uh, you should click on it and select the language you would like to listen to during the, the session. We also added some information on the topic on a virtual poster that you can find in the main hall by the other information board. So this year's theme, Open Isn't Enough, was actually inspired by a conversation we had about this with a Latin American colleague. Uh, when this conversation came up, the Cinemateca Brasileira was already on our radar. And then the first fires at the Villa Leopoldina took place, described by the field and the media as a tragedy foretold. We saw in this case an example of what can happen when access to open source software becomes an almost irrelevant factor before the threat of audiovisual heritage endangerment due to state negligence, and this is the focus or, of our discussion today. So with that little note, we would like to, for the panelists to introduce themselves, and maybe we can start with you, Ines, and you pass it on to another panelist. Um, okay, thanks. Uh, ah, eu, eu tenho que falar em português, desculpe. <laughs> é, uh, É interessante que a gente tem um grupo aqui de... É, eu, eu não estou na Cinemateca Brasileira, eu, infelizmente, não fui convidada é, nesse momento, nesse contrato, é, mas eu trouxe essa experiência a partir é, né, do, desses quatro anos lá. E a gente tem aqui a Débora, que é, é diretora dessa associação... And... There we have the director of this association of audiovisual heritage, which is a fight, a very important fight we have had these last years. And we are one of the cinematecas, like I mentioned with Marcos Mello, we have lots of challenges. And at the same time, we're very proactive. We have several activities carried out. Since I left the Cinemateca, I have worked independently in several projects. And I mentioned this project as absolute darling, this project of Tamakan. And now I'm involved in three projects using this tool regarding repositories. But Valeria, I, I've said too much, I think. Please, Deborah, I pass the floor to you. 
Hi, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I thank you for the invitation. I'm from Brutusi. I'm Deborah Brutusi. I'm a cultural producer, curator, and audiovisual producer, and the current president of the Brazilian Association of Audiovisual Heritage. So I'll, I'll provide a, a very, that's my brief presentation, I'd like to pass the floor to my other colleagues so that we can start discussing based on Ines's amazing presentation. Okay, so now I'll introduce myself. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Jose Quintal. I'm the coordinator of Rio de Janeiro's MAM Cinemateca, responsible for the programming also, and the technical coordinator of CLIMB, which is Latin American. É um prazer estar aqui compondo essa mesa com meus colegas brasileiros, mas, é, nessa mesa internacional, é, para falar é, sobre a questão da Cinemateca Brasileira, sobre a questão é, da preservação audiovisual é, no Brasil e na América Latina, e de uma maneira mais geral. É, e acho que a apresentação também da, da Inês foi fundamental, talvez, para a gente poder ter essa conversa de uma maneira é, mais clara e mais compreensível para todos. Obrigado. Boa tarde a todos. Eu sou Marcos Melo. Good morning, da... good afternoon, everyone. I'm Marcos Melo from the Cinemateca Capitolio of the city of Porto Alegre, which is the newest Cinemateca in Brazil. It was launched in 2015. So our story is quite short yet, but it's as unstable and constant as all the other Cinemateca Brasileiras. The story of audiovisual preservation in Brazil is very inconstant, as Fabiana Ferreira well put in the text mentioned by Inês. Porto Alegre is a city at the south of Brazil, at the extreme south of Brazil, a very important state, Rio Grande do Sul, in terms of audiovisual production, including the first type of cinema we did there, the most, the oldest, Brazilian film called Os Óculos do Vovô, The Glasses of Grandpa, was produced in the city of Pelotas in 1913. Pelotas is also in Rio Grande do Sul state, so we have a long tradition of cinema in Brazilian cinema. And Cinemateca, Porto Alegre Cinemateca was created with the intention of preserving the films created in Rio Grande do Sul state. And we're very proud to say that it, it, its headquarter is in a very beautiful street cinema launched in 1928. It's beautiful. It always worked as a cinema house and it remained shut for about 20 years. Then it was opened then to, to headquarter the Cinemateca. So Porto Alegre is one of the few cities in the world that can be proud of saying that it preserved a cinema place, a cinema theater from the 1920s and of now re reusing it as a way of preserving the films made in the state. So thank you very much. So I will start with our first question for the panel. And I think <clears throat> I'm going to start. I'm going to ask. As far as I understood him correctly, his institution is newer. And our question is, uh, what are your thoughts, um, all of you, uh, but let's start with Marcus, on the regional impact of uh, Cinemateca Brasileira's closing in the mid-2020? What was the impact on your institution? Foi, foi enorme, uh, Alessandra, o impacto. It was huge, Alessandra, the impact, because we depend heavenly, heavenly on the Cinemateca Brasileira. Not only technically, but also the access to data bank of the Cinemateca Brasileira, which is really wonderful, which was also shut down during this period. Now it's back, but we weren't even able to to do any research that from based on it because our institution is very new we're still prospecting and localizing the gaucho films gaucho are the people from rio grande do state rio grande do sul states so 
we need information, uh, for example, about long features produced in the 60s, 70s in Rio Grande do Sul. And these copies are in Cinemateca Brasileira, it's negatives. And we're even able to have this information because it was shut down. This film, is it actually there? What's its state, what its condition? We didn't have access to this type of information. So that was a very huge impact, this crisis of the Cinemateca Brasileira. Because it centralizes the preservation in Brazil. I more particularly was very shaken, extremely shaken after the fires, the, the last fire that took place in Cinemateca Brasileira. I have to confess that I became deeply depressed. I wrote an article in a Rio Grande do Sul newspaper where I expressed this feeling of mine of rage, impotence, of not being able to do anything to avoid this announced strategy because it was an announced tra tragedy. And more than that, it was a project, a government project of destroying culture, destroying our archives, our films. So I was really, really, really upset. So most recently I became excited again, I have to confess, when I watched film The Living Records of Our Memories of Ines Torreira. I, I believe you know this film. It's a very beautiful documentary recently launched where she recovers the story of preservation of audiovisual material throughout the world and Cinemateca is very fe is featured in the film at, uh, uh, relevantly featured in the film and seeing all the story the difficulties the, the shared difficulties in the many countries for different reasons and it gave me a certain type of hope that we're all fighting together we're all in the same ship it, from the beginning, it's been difficult and it will continue to be difficult, but we remain in this struggle to preserve films and keep them alive. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Also, thank you very much for this very personal testimony. And uh, I'm going to ask the same question to Jose, but maybe open it up broader to uh, the global scale. So not only if you can speak to of course, you're in yourself on a local and a regional level, but also how do you think the, the closing of the Cinemateca impacted um, uh, the, the world heritage, uh, our world heritage, our shared um, audiovisual heritage around the world? Thank you, Alessandra, for your question. I believe that this Cinemateca crisis reflects the fragility of the field as a whole. It's very strong in Brazil. We saw through the presentation of Inés that in terms of instability, this instability is quite, it goes way back. Marcus also talked a lot about this, the inconstancy of the, the, not the only the Brazilian, but the Latin America fragility regarding audiovisual heritage in general. An institution, the size of Cinemateca Brasileira with its rec inter international recognition being shut down for more than a year Having this possibility of being shut down for more than a year is something to think about, even with the international protests, such from FIAPI, roundtables organized in several countries, such as Klein, Latin America, from Latin America. Still, this had no actual impact in opening the institutional. That's something we have to think about. Cinemateca Brasileira is the main Brazilian institution in the sense because it preserves not only Brazilian audiovisual, but also 
from foreign films also, documents on Brazilian cinema, of, of course, together with other institutions, but it leads to the work, it, it federates. It's, a, it's the main federation of this work, let's put it this way. But it's something to think about. And how can we act in a more collective way, going beyond the, the moments of crisis to protect this heritage so that these actions are actually effective in an organic way, in an organized way, not only regarding the past of the audiovisual, which has already become heritage, but regarding the production today, the current production, the digital films also, as Inés showed also, and that is also completely out of scope of the institutions and that demands um, working in a network and demands an archive ecosystem at the global, regional and local level so that we can face inequalities because the inequalities are huge from the global south the global north and the regions inequalities have increased and they shout out to us they they are overwhelming and we we see also this in the lack of participation from the south in the discussions of the north and that is what i'd like to say thank you um <laughs> thank you jose um this is very powerful it's making me a bit of a, a bit emotional on on uh, on multiple levels um and it's also slightly disheartening to hear that international efforts because that was a question we had for for later on um aren't as effective as, as we wish they would be um and this is a question also i think that we at no time to wait would like to kind of address or 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 pull together how can we actually enact change or how actually can we enact support within this community um and we hope that this this panel is a or this conversation is a starter is the beginning of something larger than in ourselves and, and larger than the than this event once a year but i think um uh, valeria i'm gonna pass over to you yes thank you alessandra and thank you jose for sharing your perspective um our next question is what well, we heard about you know the temporary reopening of the cinemateca and we feel kind of excited about that but what does this temporary right uh reopening mean uh in your opinion and also i feel like most of us uh learned about the situation of the cinemateca brasileira through the work of the trabalhadores da cinemateca brasileira group um so i also wanted to ask you what you feel is the importance of these kinds of groups and if you feel like um the work that that they did uh had any effect on this reopening um and maybe for these questions we can start with deborah Obrigada pela pergunta. É justamente acho que o ponto que eu ia tocar. Thank you for the question. That exact precisely the point that I was going to address Marcos and José they addressed it very well the more broad impact of it, but the, I'd like to address also the impact that it has on the workers, the audiovisual workers. ABP is an organization of workers and this crisis instability affects us hugely. We have few places to train workers, few, few workers are actually become trained and graduate in the sense and everything gets lost with this instability of agreements. Lo many workers, they migrate to another career. That's very huge because people have to make their living, especially in the pandemics. Our field of, of practice is already very reduced in Brazil. 
because we need to have greater recognition and understanding of the importance of audiovisual workers. Of course, some institutions have been working on this awareness, but at the same time, these workers, they do not occupy these spaces, spaces of training, formation, of awareness, and their look, their voice is essential to bring broader and more poignant questions, long lasting questions. So it's very important that the workers that work with the heritage of the audiovisual also are in this with us. So very many workers with long experience, broad experience were fired or migrated to another career. And this lack of lack of stability makes this happen. So I could say that this impact was huge in the crisis. And also the last years, it has been very difficult to have this voice, the voice of the workers that worked in Cinemateca Brasileira for several reasons, due to the history of the institution. It was, in, it, it came into a, a public call in 1984, but the employment contract has always been very fragile because um, the more public servant aspect of it was not, it did not become solid enough. So the employment agreements have always been very fragile and that also impacted a lot. And that is why it was very important that these workers came out to the public and, and voiced out what was happening, their struggles, and based on all their experience, including technical experience. experience. But Cinemateca Brasileira, it, it's a very curious history that it has because we have this history of of being very unstable, causing depression, melancholy. We're always facing crisis, cycl cyclic crisis. But I think that at the same time, this specific time showed the power, the strength of these workers in Brazil and the power of union, of collectiveness, of how in, in a collective together we can make things happen when we work around a purpose. So Brazil is this very crazy country, we could say, and never talked so much about audiovisual preservation as much as I did in this period of crisis. And not only among us who are in the field, but also to the public, to the Brazilian public in general. So the work of the group of, of Cinemateca Brasileira workers was very important to give us a bit more about the perspective from the technical experience they have. And I think it was essential to unite the field as a whole. I'd also like to add to Deborah's speech. We never talked so much. We have greater reach, of course. We are discussing with other groups and not just internally, but it's still a great challenge to uh, make, apart from the government, of course, because we're in a very, in a terrible mo time. There is no dialogue with the, the extreme right wing, but let's think a bit about the producers also, the audiovisual producers, the more traditional groups. We all, it has always been difficult to dialogue with them. So for example, what are the main challenges to open the Cinemateca? First thing that I would comes to mind is the amount of producers that can have access to the materials and that uh, I don't know why they can understand that. Before the 2013 crisis, there were about 143 technicians in addition to the cleaning, security, and the entire support team. So 
with a team of 20 people, how can you actually meet all the demands? You can't. So in practice, my experience has been really bad with producers. The rate of material approval is very low. So which shows that producers, they don't have much awareness. They have a, a, my best friend is a cinema producer, for example just a personal story here. And then she came to me to complain about the technical recommendations about the, the, the technical recommendations regarding technical preservation. And she said, this is absurd. It's too much what they are demanding. So, and although I see advances, a greater participation patient from producers companies and so on and professionals from the audiovisual industry who have been very active in this manifestation is still a great challenge and although we did not have any type of aid to the workers that had to stop working due to the pandemics we had great players such as netflix for example created a fund to support professionals from audiovisual, a very important fund, a relevant fund. I've been saying this for a while. I think we have to create mechanisms with these players to make feasible the recovery of Brazilian works, artworks, audiovisual works, because we have lost so much. But not that, ju not just that. Many things are still being lost. I talked to Netflix and they said, well, we have the, the difficulty regarding the technical delivery of the audiovisual project, but they have the legal issues also. We have lots of work to do, guys. So we are many, we are few, but we are very talented. So just to tell Marcus that I was very happy to, be, I, was, I became very unhappy when the fire took place and I share with you your emotional reaction. I was completely devastated also. No, not that the institution was, I mean, many people were already dying, yes, but the, the fire was a complete uh, defeat for us. Thank you. I'm so sorry that I have to interrupt, but we're running over time. I'm so sorry, Ness, if you could. I'm so sorry. Um, no, okay. Uh, so, tem uma, uma pergunta do Kieran. I just have a question. There's just a question here. Okay, that and I, then we have to the move chat on. That I will sorry. Answer. And you can ask questions in Gathertown or, stay, or, or later on contact these great panelists. Thank you so much to everybody. I'm so sorry. Thank you. Muito obrigado. É nós que agradecemos, Alessandra. We que... thank you. No, we thank you, Alessandra, for this <laughs> space that you guys have offered us. It's very important. Okay. Um, um, uh, Alessandra, any other final words? Okay, then um, uh, first of all, thank you all, uh, so much to all the panelists um, for sharing. Um, we, we really appreciate it. And a uh, special thanks to Carolina for translating.